Yeah, well, I'm going to invite, invite my son up, Graham, to come and preach the word to us at this time. And uh, Graham grew up in this church. I still remember him running around this church in a cape uh, on Sunday mornings. You might, some of you remember those days. And the Lord got a hold of, of Graham and, and uh, saved him and, and then called him to preach God's word. So as a minister of the gospel, uh, to another minister of the gospel, preach the word, brother. No cape this morning, so (laughs) I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians this morning. Uh, We are accustomed to hearing the narrative of Christmas, uh, but this morning we're going to look at Christmas uh, in Paul, seeing what Paul comments on the narrative of Christmas, that first coming of uh, Christ, the first advent And as we turn to Galatians chapter 3 this morning, Paul's writing a letter to the church in Galatia. It's a church that's lost sight of the gospel. It's a church that has started with the spirit but has moved on to the flesh. They have moved past faith uh, into works. And so they are struggling with some of the simple things they need to remember. And we will read uh, 10 verses this morning um, from Galatians chapter 3, but we will be focusing uh, our time on two of those verses, verses 4 and 5 of chapter 4. But let us read together from God's holy word, Galatians chapter 3, starting at verse 26. This is the word of Almighty God. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. So ends the reading of God's Word, let us go before him in prayer this morning. Our great God, we come before you and we ask for you to make the scripture living and active to our hearts and our minds. We ask that you would grant the spirit to convict and to conform our hearts into the image of Christ that you would uh, make your word clear to us and that you would draw us to yourself through it, that we may see Christ and we may see your great plan of salvation. We ask and we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. What is history? That record of the past, that map of time, that trail of culture. And if you've ever studied history, the question always comes up, well, where is history going? Where is history going? That's not necessarily what the historian does, but it's a question that comes up again and again. And there's different answers to that question, where is history going? And I was looking up various answers, and one answer is often sees history as a wheel of time. This is called Kalchakra in in Tibetan Buddhism and it's in Hindu thought as well as different Buddhist traditions. The idea that time is a wheel, turning, spinning, rotating, not necessarily progressing, but cyclical. 
again and again from life to death to rebirth to life again. We see it in the seasons, right? Spring to summer to fall to winter. Uh, some of us see it in the seasons, that is. <laughs> But that sort of thought is in Eastern thought, but it's also in Western thought. It's, uh, you know, in uh, some of the philosophers like the Stoics had this image of history as a circle that we are part of uh, a divine spark is in every person that is branched off of the one and will eventually in time return back to that one. And that Stoic thought, Marcus Aurelius and others, uh, promote that idea. But scripture teaches something different about history. This passage teaches us about God's plan in history, God's purpose in history, and it's a direction. It's going somewhere. There is a purpose in God's history. And so we're going to look at God's plan in history, uh, and we're going to look first at the action of God's plan. What, what's the verb of this sentence? What is the, the central action of verses 4 and 5 it's found God sent his son. The action being sending, the, the, the one doing the action being God the father, and then the, the object of that action being the son. The essence of these verses is that the father sends Christ. So do you see kind of how this is a, in many ways a quintessential Christmas passage in Paul. The father sending the son. That is the core of it, the first advent, that first coming. And this word for sending is very intentional word. It's a word used for sending a person to a location or to a mission as we send a diplomat or we send our sons off to war. It's very, direct, um, very intentional looking at a location. And this is God's plan in history, sending his son. And that action that God sent the Son implies to us that the Son is uh, in some way equal with the Father. The Son was not created at the incarnation, but it was existing prior to that. And there was a decision made that the Son who was beside the Father would be sent forth into the world. And so it's a nod in many ways at the divinity of Christ, this passage. And so we see, this is a, a quintessential Christmas advent. God's plan in history is to send his son on a mission to a specific location. And we're going to look at, well, when was that? What's the timing of this plan? Well, how was that done? The, the nature of this plan. And then the sphere of God's plan. Uh, when, when uh, really, when did he do that? Uh, and then lastly, why he did that, why he did that. So when God sent the son, how God sent the son, uh, where is actually the third one. It's not when twice, but it's where he sent it. And then why, why? And we see the, the timing is very clear. It's the first line. When the time had fully come, or as the ESV puts it, in the fullness of time. God the Father waited until the exact moment to accomplish his plan. Which might bring up the question, well, why then? Why was it in the first century? What is this fullness of time exactly? And there's various possibilities, various um, suggestions made. Some have pointed out the stability at the time, the Pax Romana allowed there to be a great peace across the known world. Some have pointed out the transportation networks that were in place, the roadways that allowed for easy travel. Others have pointed out the, the unity of the language at that time, that the communication, that the gospel could be proclaimed in Greek across much of the known world in a quick, fast way. And others have pointed out various other features, like there was a cultural cohesion, the Greco-Roman thinking was very monolithic, or there was a religious slump, the heathen gods were not quite as popular. And you can go on and on and think about, well, I wonder why God did it at that moment. But we can't actually get into the mind of God. We don't know the real answer to that. But we need to affirm that it was the fullness of time. It was the exact precise moment the Father had intended. Verse 2 puts it until the time set by the Father. In other words, the launch sequence to God's plan has reached zero. 
All systems are a go, and now in the incarnation we have the launch, the ignition. And God's rocket of redemption is blasting off. That's the picture. What does this tell us about God's view of history? What does this tell us about uh, our life? What does this mean? Well, it shows us first that God is not working on plan B. That God's not trying out different methods. He's not calling an audible. He's not freestyling history. He's not flying by the seat of his pants. He is planning and working intentionally in history. It was in the fullness of time that the Father sent the Son. And also it shows us God's not slow in working his plans. He acts in history exactly when he wants to. When the ages had filled up to the brim, then God opens the levees and lets the water out. And that's not just then, that's now. That God is working his plans in history in the fullness of time, even now, in our very lives. It's not accidental that that happened. It's part of God's plan. And it shows us that this is how God works in history. In the fullness of time, he worked. And it assures us as Christians, as we wonder, well, it's been a long time since the first coming. We maybe wonder, it's, when is the next event going to happen? Is Christ going to really be coming back? And it assures us that God has not forgotten his plan in history. Just in the fullness of time, the first coming happened. So in the fullness of time, God will send forth his son again to return to earth. And so it gives us a great assurance and confidence we're not just wondering what God's doing. We may not know all the details and understand it, but just as Christ, in, or just as the fa- Father sent the Son exactly when he wanted, so he's going to send the Son to return exactly when he wants. And that's when the plan is. That's the timing of God's plan. It's in the fullness of time. But how will God send his eternal Son to earth? What's the nature of God's plan? How was Christmas done? You know the answer. You've heard it many times, but it's, it's very clearly and succinctly put in Paul's word there. Born of a woman. God doesn't send his son into the world riding on the clouds. He doesn't send his son in a vision or in a dream. He doesn't send his son as a messenger like an angel temporarily. He intends and plans, and so he sent his son through a natural birth. The son would take on a human nature. The son would live an entire human life on earth. He would be born like every one of us and everyone in history. He would grow and develop like you and me. He would experience this very earth. He experienced the elements 40 days in the wilderness under the beating sun. He experienced this raging storm on the Sea of Galilee. He understands what wind and rain is. He knows what it's like to be outside on a crisp night in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. He's experienced the misery of this life, hasn't he? He knows and has seen sickness and disease and poverty and pain. He experienced the humanness of life. He walked on dusty roads. He ate the lamb at the Passover meal annually. He drank wine at the wedding of Cana. He probably ate bread that was baked in Capernaum. He was slept on the back of a boat. He wept over dead friends. And so we look at this and we see that God our Father sent his son to assume to himself a human nature By being born of a woman. That was how he intended to do it. And as Christians, and maybe even as non-Christians, we can think to ourselves, well, God is a little bit far off sometimes. Have you ever felt that God is a bit esoteric? Unable to understand your exact life. Unable to relate fully. He knows it in the same way that someone who's read a book knows it. He knows everything, just like someone who's read a book knows everything. But they may not actually know it. 
If you feel that way and you've thought that way, then you need to reflect upon the how of Christmas. That Jesus came into the earth by assuming humanity. He's not separate from the human project. He's part of the human project. He takes on the human race. He becomes fully human. Jesus witnessed arguments on earth. He witnessed and experienced long days of work and long weeks of work. And so this needs to sink in that we need to grasp the proximity of God to his people. And often we think God is out there. He's far away. Well, we probably haven't reflected upon Christmas and the how of Christmas long enough to realize he didn't just look like a human. He was born of a woman. Everything that's human, he experienced. And doesn't that shape our very prayer life? How we pray to God, how we pray through Christ. We don't pray hoping he's going to be able to understand that sort of thing or that he's maybe experienced that emotion. No, he is human, even now. And we're praying to him as we talk to him. And you see how this shapes the way we think about God, shapes the way we think about our very prayers. And so that's the how, the nature of God's plan, born of a woman. And we saw the timing of God's plan, the fullness of time. Well, where does God send Jesus? Where does God send Jesus? And you might answer the obvious question, well, to earth and to Bethlehem. But I mean more in the sense of culturally, where does he send Jesus? Where was Christmas? And verse 4 The next clause lets us know the sphere of God's plan. It is born under law. Born under law. It's a succinct, compact statement. But what does he mean in this context of Galatians, born under law? And it's pretty simple. It means that Jesus came within the sphere of the Mosaic law. He was born of a Jewish mother. He was born into a Jewish nation. He was born under the Jewish law system. Well, that leads to the question, why? Why is that mentioned? What does that mean in God's broader plan that Jesus came to earth born under law? And the reason Paul mentions that is simple. Jesus came to obey the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Jesus came to achieve and earn righteousness. And so he was born under or within the sphere of the law so that he could achieve exactly what he was sent to achieve, perfect righteousness. And that can be found in numerous examples. I'll give you two places where we see Jesus obeying the law or being within the sphere of the law. One of them is from infancy. Uh, You've probably, or are going to read Luke chapter 2 this week. And if you keep reading in Luke chapter 2, after the birth, later on, the next couple verses, that Jesus is still an infant, and Joseph of Mary go to the temple. And they go to dedicate their child. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 22 to 24, it says three different times, That it is according to the law of Moses that this was done. The sacrifice was according to the law of Moses. The idea being that Jesus, even from infancy, was within this sphere of the law, already following it. But we can see it also later in life. Uh, There's uh, Jesus' baptism. He's being being baptized by John the Baptist. I don't know if you remember what happens, but they they get out there and they're going to get baptized. And and John is saying, you're going to baptize me. And Jesus says, no, no, you're going to baptize me. And John's like, no, no, you're going to baptize me. You got it all mixed up. And they kind of have this little moment there. And then it says in Matthew 3.15, Jesus said, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as he realizes, oh, this is part of fulfilling the law. You are required to do this. Then John says, okay, I'll do it. Because Jesus came within the law, born under the law to fulfill 
the law. And so as we put this together, God's plan in history, the action is God sends forth his son. The timing of it is the fullness of time, exactly when the father intended. The, the how of it is born of a woman, natural birth, a tr- true human. And then the sphere that this plan has accomplished, it's under the law so that Jesus could be the perfect law keeper. And you might say, Why? To all those questions. Why send the son? Why send him born of a woman? Why send him under the law? What's the purpose of God's plan in history? And Paul gives two answers to that question of the purpose of God's plan. He gives two two goals. The first is to redeem. And the second is to adopt. You see that in verse 5. To redeem those under the law. To redeem, what does that mean? It's it's marketplace language, it's business world language, it's a commercial language. It's to release something by paying a price. To buy up, to buy back as it were. It's saying Jesus came to purchase his people at a cost. And the cost was his life. And that payment occurred on the cross. Which tells us something very important about the incarnation. The incarnation is never to be disconnected from the cross. Christmas always leads to the cross, to the crucifixion. That in our minds we are to link the first coming with Jesus' death and resurrection. They're not separate things, they are linked together. And so when we consider the baby Jesus in the cradle, we are to consider, consider Jesus on the cross in the same thought. And so as we go about and we see nativity scenes and other symbols of the incarnation, and we've been seeing them for weeks and we will see them for the next week or so, we are to realize the purpose of all this is to purchase human beings at the cost of Jesus' life on the cross. That was the purpose of the coming of Christ. And do you see how God's plan and God's purpose in redemption fit together? He's born of a woman because he's going to redeem those who are born of women. He came as a human to redeem humanity. He's born under the law because he's going to redeem those who are under the law. In other words, he came to be righteous to give us his righteousness. Or as Philip Ryken points out everything Paul has said so far about Christ's coming, his timely arrival, his eternal deity, his true humanity, and his perfect obedience qualified him to be our redeemer. Those fit together. All those details of the incarnation, the fullness of time, born of a woman, born under law, fit so he could redeem those under the law. And so the incarnation is not the sentimental part of Jesus. It's actually an essential component for the cross. They fit together. And so the first picture, the first reason, the first purpose of Christ's coming is so that we could be freed from slavery. That's really what the redeemed language is. That the yoke of slavery of the law could be taken off and we could be taken out of that situation. And that's all wrapped up when we think about the wonder of being freed from slavery in the incarnation and the Christmas story. But then Paul gets even more elevated. He gets more excited about the second feature, the second purpose of Christ's coming. The ultimate goal of the incarnation, do you see what it is as he ends in verse 5? That we might receive the full rights of sons. God sent Jesus in order to redeem and in order to have us receive adoption. That was the purpose of Christ's coming. He came to bring us into his very family. And not just to take us in as orphans, but to put us in his house And not in the basement, but in the same room as his son. 
So what does adoption, this idea of adoption mean? What does it teach us for you and me? That Jesus came to adopt us? It shows that God's plan is very personal. He adopts people by name, right? To adopt into the family is not a general idea. You don't adopt a group. You adopt a specific thing. It's not a general concept. We're going to adopt. We adopt and there is a name written on the paper. There's a particular person in mind. And so when we think of God adopting, sending Jesus to adopt, we need to realize this is very personal. It's God's personal action for a specific person, for you, for his children. And so we are to see the intimacy of redemption. It's not a general sending for a general idea. He's sending to adopt, and adopting is personal. But also, God's plan is not just personal in adopting, it is loving in adopting. He adopts people he loves. Now, adoption doesn't mean you are lovable or worthy or qualified. Adoption means God has set his love on you. That God delights in you. That God has directed his heart and his affections and his desires upon you. To such a degree that he wants to adopt you into his family. Do you see how love simply orbits salvation? Do you realize how God the Father actually loves us that much? And so when we see the incarnation, we see the love of God, not just on the cross, but in the fact that he wants to adopt us and has adopted us into his family. So God's plan is very personal. You adopt an individual. God's plan is very loving. He set his love on us. But you also have to see God's plan is grand. He sent Jesus to adopt us. God's ultimate purpose for you is not so that you can live a guilt-free life. It's not simply to wash away the past. Rather, God wants to include you into his very family. It's a little bit grander than just saying, I don't have this anymore. It's all the other blessings that come with that. That God's purpose is epic. It's marvelous. It's grand. It's unfathomable. That he sent his son, not just to remove filth, but to bring us and draw us into his very family, to adopt us in. And Christmas is simply filling out the adoption paperwork. And it's moving to that. And, and then it's accomplished when you are united to Christ by faith. But it's that paperwork is set down. It's, it's the ball is in motion and it's going to happen. So God's plan is very personal when we see its adoption. We see that God's plan is very loving when it's adoption. But we also see that God's plan is very grand. It's adoption. Something higher than sometimes we uh, give it credit for. But also God's plan is rich. Adoption contains abundant blessings. We have legally all the rights and blessings of an adopted child. And what are some of those rights and blessings that we get? The Westminster Confession of Faith gives a list in chapter 12, section 1. You have his name put upon you. You receive the spirit of adoption. You have access to the throne of grace with boldness. You're enabled to cry, Abba, Father. You are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by him as by a father. Yet you are never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption. And you inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. So what are some of those blessings? God puts his name on you, authentically approving that you are his. A mark so that every spiritual being that tries to terrorize you will know they are messing with God's child. So we should live in security. His name is on us. But also God placed his spirit within you. Not some other spirit, but that spirit that Jesus had. That you go, wow, Jesus did all those things because he had the spirit. That's the spirit you have, the spirit of adoption given to you. And then you have a key to God's throne. 
the Christian has the heavenly VIP pass, the backstage access to God. But then it says on top of that that you can cry out, Abba, Father. That the Christian has the attention of God. Not just that you get to enter the room, but you actually have the king's ear. That you're allowed to be there and supposed to be there and you will be listened to. And then it goes on and talks about how God has a place in his heart for us. That we are pitied and protected for. There's compassion there. That's part of adoption. That's part of the blessing. That he guards his own because they are adopted. He supplies his own, providing for them because they are adopted. He cares for his own because of our adoption. Even going to the point of disciplining, chastening us. You know, if there was a child running around and someone disciplined them, you would know that that's probably the parent. You don't, you don't just go up and discipline someone else's child. The parent does that. Not a friend or an uncle or someone else. It's an authentication that that really is their child. And so if God chastens you, you're his own. And then it's the adoption is that it's a seal that you're going to receive all of the inheritance that's planned for you on the last day. The promise of that. Those are some of the things, some of the blessings, some of the riches that God intended for you and for me by sending Christ Jesus on the, in the incarnation. And to see those from a different perspective, we could look at them through lies they combat. The lie comes up, I am, un, I am worthless, I am unimportant, I am insignificant, I am shameful. No, you're a child of God sealed by his spirit. That's what adoption says. Or you might say, I'm forgotten, I am ignored, I'm rejected, I'm alone. No, you're adopted into God's family. So he pities you, he protects you, and he provides for you. Or the lie might come up, well, God doesn't listen to me. He doesn't listen to me. No, you're adopted into his family, so you have direct access to God. He does listen. Or the lie comes up, I'm saved and I'm free and I'm liberated. I don't have to do what I want. Or I can do what I want. No, you're adopted. God's name is put on you. It's not your name anymore. And God cares enough for you that he will chasten you. Or the lie comes up, well, I'm directionless. I'm purposeless. I have no hope. Well, then we've lost sight of our adoption, which is the seal that we have all the wealth of heaven waiting for us. All the inheritance of the maker and his family ready. And so I think the, the wonder of these two purposes of God, the first being redemption, is that redemption removes the slavery. But guess what? If someone's redeemed, if someone's bought out of slavery, their pockets are empty. <laughs> They're probably as happy as can be, but they don't have anything. They're starting at ground zero. But that's not where God stops. He says he came in order to redeem and to adopt. So that we have all the blessings, all the riches, all the wealth of God's family given over to us. Isn't it a great comfort but also a great joy to see God's plan and purpose in history. And so when you see the manger or when you hear about the angels proclaiming the incarnation to the shepherds, we are to see God's plan in history. But we're not just to stop there. We're to look at God's purpose in history for you and for me and that is that we would enjoy all the blessings of the adoption of being brought into his very family. That we are precious in his sight. And if you don't know those blessings, they're, they're offered to you this very day. You merely believe in him, even this moment. And all of those blessings, God's personal care and his love and his richness and abundance will be offered to you in the person of Jesus Christ. Freely and fully. And if you do know those blessings, 
Well, let's reflect upon them a little bit this Christmas. That Paul's perspective of Christmas is that God sent Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law, in the fullness of time, in order to redeem those under the law, and in order that we might receive the adoption. What love, what wonder, what glorious plans God has for his children. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you and we thank you that you have sent your Son, Christ Jesus, to die on the cross to redeem us from our slavery to redeem us and purchase us out of darkness into light. But even more, you have sent Christ to adopt us into your very family. You have set your love upon us, personally drawing us in to your household. And we thank you for that. We praise you for that. Lord, help us to remember that, to reflect upon that, to meditate upon that this week, that we may give you praise that we might find joy in the coming of Christ in the first advent. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come now to the table of our Lord as his adopted children, redeemed by his mighty precious blood that we might come into his presence and feed upon him, not physically, but feed upon him spiritually. This is food for our soul, food for our spirits. We might remember what he's done for us, why he came for us, who we are now to him. It's coming back to those basics of, of what he's done for us and then branching out to live for him throughout this next week. And so this table was for those who are trusting that Jesus came for them, that Jesus died for them, that Jesus is for them, uh, their Savior. And if that's not who you are yet, then let the bread and the cup pass and be praying, be asking God to give you faith, draw you to himself. You might trust in him, in him alone. He died for you, that he came for you that he's coming for you. Pray to him. Ask him to be your savior, even today. He will receive you. You know deep down in your heart that these things are true. And the spirit of God has been working on you, even this morning. And so be brought to that glorious glory of knowing that you are his and that all these things we heard preached to us are true now of you, too. So let's uh, pray together. Father, we ask that you would bless us and strengthen us now as we come to your table at this Christmas time, that we might remember who we are, who you've made us to be, what it cost you to be our Savior, to make us what we are in you. Lord, we thank you that we can trust your word, that it's firm, it doesn't change, it doesn't shift under our feet, it doesn't go through our fingers. It is a, a word that that will forever be true. And that you became that word in flesh and you give us that word in your word, the scriptures, and we are yours by your miracle of grace. Oh Lord, now may we feast, may we eat with joy, with great joy, because of what you've done for us. And may our hearts be turned to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.